Well, hello. Hello, and thank you all for coming. This is very exciting um, for me uh, and a little bit nerve wracking, too, because this is something uh, that I have been working on on and off, uh, but certainly um, more, uh, much more on than off in the last uh, two or three years. Um, but it's something of mine that goes back to, uh, I just, it's funny, I just looked through my files to see like what was the earliest kind of document that I had for this. And it, uh, it goes all the way back to 2004. So it predates um, Eli. It predates pretty much everything um, that, of mine that you've seen. And um, it is something that, oh God, I'm very orange, aren't I? Let's see what we can do about that. There we go. Get a little bit cooler. Too orange. I look like I went to like a bad tanning salon. Let's fix that. There we go. 
A little bit warmer. A little bit warmer. There we go. Back in the CGW days. No, I never worked for CGW. I worked for PC Gamer, which was the bigger, the bigger and better magazine. Um, but certainly in that era, yes. Um, I will. I'm going to do my best to kind of keep an eye on the chat here and uh, and answer questions as as we go. As I do my little spiel here, which is not in any way rehearsed or prepared. I'm just going to kind of wing it. Um, but, uh, yeah, so all the way back in 2004, when I was first trying to generate ideas to get people to notice me in, as a screenwriter, um, I had this thing. The very first thing I, that I wrote that got me any attention, uh, and got me into Hollywood was this thing called Oliver, which was a, um, kind of a weird steampunk post-apocalyptic retelling of Oliver Twist that uh that kind of reimagined the Oliver character as a as a genetically engineered superhero and that's what that's what first got me into the business uh but of course as, as I'm sure as you obviously know it never got made as a as a movie because um original science fiction is very very difficult to get made unless you are of a certain stature if you're JJ J. Abrams or Christopher Nolan or someone of that level you can do it uh but for the rest of us it's quite difficult. If you want to do something kind of low budget, you know, like Alex Garland obviously is out there doing amazing work. Um, but unfortunately, because I grew up on a lot of kind of big Hollywood entertainment, I grew up on Star Wars and Star Trek and Battlestar Galactica and all that stuff. That's what I always wanted to do. And so, you know, to obviously eventually get to be able to work on, on, on not something like Star Wars, but actually Star Wars was, was, was really amazing for me. But my first love and my first uh ambition has like the thing that i most want to do is is bring original things into the world it was a tremendous privilege to to do star wars and it was great to work on the walking dead and it's a tremendous amount of fun to write batman which i'm doing right now for dc comics but they're all other people's sandboxes and there's only so much latitude you're given because you don't own them you didn't create those things you're just privileged to be able to kind of play in that area for a while um but what I really like to do and what I want to do is, is generate original ideas. And I was obviously incredibly fortunate and still feel very blessed that there he is behind me right there. There's Denzel on the wall behind me um, to write an original film, an original science fiction idea that actually would get made into a big budget Hollywood movie. That almost never happens, but it happened to me. And I was incredibly uh, fortunate that that was the case. Um, but I remember, it's funny. I remember when I was watching it for the first time and they really did make the movie that I wrote. It was kind of miraculous and I got quite emotional, but I also remember thinking at the time, that's it. That's the one you get. You've played your Joker early in your career. Like you're never going to get to do another big original movie. And I haven't yet. It's 12 years since Eli came out and I haven't been able to get another big original science fiction movie made. But I mean, I was obviously can't complain with the direction of my career has gone in, you know, again, I've got to do all these amazing things, um, and, and work on, 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 on incredible things. Uh, but I have been at the same time, even though, even as I've been paying the bills, working on these big existing properties that own, that, uh, that, um, belong to other people, belong to Disney and DC comics and, you know, so, and so on and so forth. Um, I have also at the same time been kind of quietly working on things in the background that I want to do my, like my own stuff, even though I know it's very, very difficult. And the long, the longer I've been in the industry, the longer I've been in this business, the more I've learned, I've learned many lessons, but one that I've certainly learned is like, it's really, really, really hard to get original genre films made above a certain level of ambition or a certain level of budget, uh, unless you are one of these huge names. Uh, and so I kind of started to think about it a little bit differently. Um, and I'll tell you what changed it for me when I was in, when I was in London working on Rogue One. So this would be back in what I want to say 2014. I, I already had my next job lined up after that. And it was an adaptation of a Mark Miller comic book called Starlight, which was kind of a Flash Gordon type thing. And it was brilliant. I really, really loved it. And I, and I got to 
go up to Glasgow and hang out with uh, with Mark, who obviously is an incredible talent, has created all these amazing things. And Mark kind of did a similar thing. Like he was like the the main Marvel comics guy for like the longest time, right? He wrote all the big, you know, Marvel comics. And then he decided that he wanted to do his own original ideas. And so he started generating his own ideas. And obviously like Kick-Ass and Kingsman, Secret Service and all that stuff came out of that. And I was talking to him about it and he was talking about how he really feels like he's found the right approach creatively in terms of getting original stuff made. Because he does, you know, he has a huge profile in comics. So he does comics. Um, and he gets, you know, because comics is not a, a business with like various layers of, you know, executives and people above you telling, oh, you got to change it. It's got to be like this. You, you, for the most part, get to do what you want to do in comics and tell the story you want to tell, which is very, certainly most of the time not the case in movies. Um, and he was talking about how, like, listen, I, I get to put out the comic book. I tell the story. I get my story in front of an audience the way I want to do it. And then if it gets made into a movie down the road, brilliant. Like, that's gravy, but that's not, like, the end game. Um, and I thought, and I started to think about that. And I started to think about how if you are interested in creating original stories, in my case, original science fiction stories, um, Hollywood is really the worst forum in which to do it. Because it is by far the uh, the medium, the industry that will put up most of a fight in terms of letting you tell your story the way you want to tell it. And of course, we understand why, right? There's huge amounts of money on the line. Like big science fiction movies cost can cost hundreds of millions of dollars to make. And people who are spending that money don't want to lose it, right? They don't want to subject it to unnecessary risk. And so one of the ways that they mitigate that risk and minimize that risk is by just basically doing things that they already know that people will like. More of the same. Let's do another Star Wars movie. Let's do another Marvel movie. Let's reboot this TV show. Let's let's make a movie out of this book that already sold 100 million copies. I, I, one example I give, and I give this example all the time when I talk about things like this, is if Suzanne Collins, who created The Hunger Games, had written that book, instead of writing a book, if she had written it as a spec screenplay for a feature film, I guarantee you no one's ever heard of The Hunger Games because no one makes that movie. Nobody. Uh, it's like, what, all these kids are murdering each other? And she's like riding around in a chariot and her dress is on fire and there's this fucking dude with blue hair. Like it's, 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 no, pass. We're not doing it. But because she wrote it as a book, which is much cheaper to get through, you know, the system and get published. It's still not easy, but, you know, you can publish a book. Um, and it went on to sell, to sell, you know, many, many millions of, of copies. Um, that suddenly becomes a much more palatable proposition for Hollywood executives. Like, oh my God, like how many people bought this book? Well, that's how many movie tickets we can sell, right? People that bought the, that like the book are going to want to see the movie version. So they go make the movie version. And so for me, like movies are still my first love and TV as well these days, of course, TV is kind of like in, on, on, on parody with movies really creatively and in terms of prestige. And that's what I like to do. I like to do things on the screen. I grew up watching movies and television and that's what, that's still kind of like the thing I like to do the most. Um, but take, but I've increasingly started to realize that in terms of original work, take, trying to take that direct route is the one that is least likely to have a happy ending. A few years ago, well, several years ago now, I had an idea for a, a movie I wanted to do called, do called Abomination, which was about, um, a medieval knight who got cursed and turned into a horrible monster. And it was like a medieval horror movie. It was set during the, the Viking invasions during the 10th, 10th century England. And by that point in my career, I'd been doing it long enough and I'd been in enough meetings and I'd been to enough studios and met enough executives and enough producers to already be able to like know exactly how that was going to go. If I were to write that story as a, as a spec screenplay, a movie that would probably cost anywhere between maybe do the cheap version for like 40, $50 million with all the visual effects and what have you. And I go into the meeting. I mean, some, office in Burbank or Santa Monica, wherever the hell it is. You do the small talk and then they say, okay, Gary, what, what have you got for us today? We can't wait to hear this idea of yours. And uh, I say, okay, right. It's 10th century England. And like right away, immediately, I can see them all just switch off. Like, oh, we're not, we're not making this 10th century England. The spreadsheets tell us that kind of stuff doesn't make money. Right. So I've written this movie. I've spent three months of my life six months, however long it takes to write, write a movie and get it exactly the way I want it. And I've fallen in love with it and I really can't wait for people to see it. 
but then it but then it just immediately gets through it takes about a week and everyone in hollywood says no and that's it it's dead and it can't come back from the dead like it's done and you move on to the next thing and so i spent like three months of my life pouring my heart into something that maybe 15 or 20 people ever read literally that like the the, the executives and the people that read it around town maybe that many, maybe more maybe 20 or 30 but that's it and so that just ends up being kind of a big heartbreaking waste of time to see that script gather dust, something that, you know, because you can't really, once you've got a script, so like you can put it on the internet, people can read it, but it's not a finished product, right? A, a, a script is not a house. It's the blueprint for building a house. And people don't really want to read scripts unless they're in the business or if they're interested in being a screenwriter themselves. They want to see the finished movie. And that's what I want to do. I want to make finished things that people can actually enjoy and see. So with Abomination, and this was shortly after I had met with Mark, I'd had the idea for it already. I thought, well, fuck, why not do what Mark does and like to find a way to tell the story in a medium that allows me to do it on my own terms. And I'd never written a novel before, so I thought it could be interesting creatively for me to try that. And so I wrote it as a novel. And it was published uh, in 2015, and it went out there, and people liked it, and it was very well received. And I that was a win for me. I got what I wanted to do. I got to, to have my story put in front of an audience and have them enjoy it and see the book sell and hear from people. I still hear from people. Oh, I really liked Abomination. It's brilliant. I love that. Um, and so that, and so that's a win. And then, and then of course, this isn't really part of the calculation, but from a, but like from a mercenary point of view, from a business point of view, once you write the book, Abomination wasn't like a, wasn't like a Hunger Games level of success or whatever, but had it been, it would also be a movie by now. So if you can if you can tell a story in a way that is easier to get in front of an audience, the way you want to tell it without like all kinds of creative interference and being fired and replaced by other writers and all the kind of things that happen on a daily uh, uh, basis in Hollywood. Um, if you can do that by publishing, for example, a book, not only do you get the creative satisfaction of knowing that your story found an audience, but now it's what they call, of course, as you all know, a piece of underlying IP. So, oh, that's a book. I know how I, I know how to turn that into a movie. I don't know how to do an original movie, but I can I can I can turn that in, I can turn that book into a movie, says Hollywood. And so maybe, you know, it becomes a movie. And I, I mentioned when I first broke in, I broke in with something called Oliver, which was this Oliver Twist story. And um again, my my managers, as soon as they read it, like they were like, Yeah, when th this is not no one's gonna make a movie. Like we like the writing and we wanna work with you as a writer, like what else have you got? But like no one's gonna make this movie and no one ever has. And that script sat around for a long time. And after Abomination was successful, I thought, why well, maybe I can find other ways to get stories in front of people that don't have to immediately try to be like big splashy Hollywood films. Again, I do, that's my day job. I'm writing like three different feature films for different people right now. Like I still do the Hollywood thing. Um, but, in, but they're all other people's ideas. They're all other. Well, actually that's not entirely true. I am actually doing a small science fiction film right now. That's based on an original idea of mine. That is like, theoretically, theoretically getting made, but much, much smaller budget. This, what you're about to see tonight is a much bigger thing. Um, and, and so I dusted off the Oliver script and I kind of reverse engineered it, reverse engineered it into a, into a comic book script. And I talked to my friend, Derek Robertson, who you may know, the co-creator of the boys. And he's actually my artist on Batman Fortress right now. He's a good friend of mine. Uh, we turned it into a comic book and we set it up at image comics and that came out and that was successful and people liked that. And so I thought, okay, maybe this is, maybe this is the new way of doing business. Like I'll pay the bills by doing whatever the next, you know, IP content thing is, oh, do you want to work on, you know, another, uh, like whether it's Star Trek or Godzilla, whatever, all the things that are out there for writers to work on that belong to other people. And there is creative satisfaction to be, to be found working on those things. But for me, not as much as creating your own thing and being kind of the master of your own creative destiny. And so having had some success with uh, bringing abomination to an audience in a way that I thought was creatively satisfying and doing that again with Oliver, I started to think, well, what, what else could I do like that? Like the other things that I wanted to make a, a big kind of science fiction feature film out of, but which aren't realistic to get made because uh, they're too expensive and they're not based on anything that anyone knows. And I'm not Christopher Nolan. I'm not a big enough name to justify it. So what, but what else could I try? And again, going back to 2004, and that brings us to this. I had this, I, I, I didn't even remember this, but it used to be called uh, A Boy and His Robot. That's what it was when it was um, first 
devised because I always wanted to do something with a big giant mech, like a big robot. Like I'm not terribly familiar with, you know, Mech Warrior and BattleTech and those kind of things. I played the first Titanfall game and I'm aware, like I'm just aware of the concept of like big fucking giant walking tanks, like weapons platforms that walk around, like these big colossus things. I've always said it's just like a super cool idea and I've always wanted to do my version of it. Um, and that's what back in 2004, Boy and His Robot was. And I never had like a really super firm idea of what the story was. But when I started to realize post Abomination and post um, Oliver that I could, that there was a route for me to bring these kind of ideas to an audience that didn't necessitate having to go through all the usual Hollywood gatekeepers and deal with all the rejection. Um, I thought, well, maybe, maybe it's time to revisit that. And I went back around 2018. I went back and I started kind of digging into it and I fleshed out the idea a little bit more. Um, and I really enjoyed writing Abomination as a, as a novel. And I thought I'd, I'd like to do, I'd like to try and do that again. I thought, you know, I, I learned a lot about how to write a book and I thought it was quite, I thought I did quite a good job with Abomination. I just really enjoyed writing it. I thought, mate, let's try it with this. Abomination is a very specific thing. It's like medieval, supernatural, horror. Um, and this is more kind of like near future post-apocalyptic sci-fi with aliens and robots and stuff like this. It's so still very genre, but like very much at the other end of the spectrum. Um, and I started to think, okay, so I'm going to write a book and I, and I, and I wrote it I, and I wrote it. It took me about, I don't know, cause I, cause I only ever work on these things like when I've got time, when I'm not being paid to do other things. So on and off, I, I think it was finished around. 2020 like over the course of two years i wrote the book and it was just sitting there and i said okay well now what what do i do with this book and again i could have i could submit it to publishers and there's a decent chance given you know the stuff that i've done in the past that somebody wants to publish it but i thought i don't know it just seems kind of like very unimaginative way to do it there's got to be more an interesting a more interesting way to do it and as luck would have it this was around the same time that I was having a lot of fun and also a lot of success with animal talking back in 2020 was the year of animal talking when, you know, we did the, the animal crossing talk show on Twitch and that really blew up. And we had tens of thousands of people watching us and Selena Gomez and Sting and Brie Larson and gorillas playing music. And it was just mad. And it really made me think about the potential of Twitch as a platform to bring different kinds of, I hate the word content, but different kinds of stuff, but different things to people. And Twitch are very, I think Twitch themselves as a company are very excited about the idea of Twitch not just being seen as a place where people go to watch other people play video games. Like, you know, music's really big on the platform right now. Comedy, like they're trying to find ways to kind of make it like an entertainment platform and not just video games. And so I had this idea to take the book and rather than submit it to a publisher and wait like two years for it to come out or whatever. <laughs> that's, like whatever. that's actually how, about long, how long it's taken to get here because they kind of did it the hard way. I thought, well, I'll self-publish the book. Just put it on Amazon and we'll just, just see what, because I just wanted to see what would happen if I did something without anyone in between, like anyone in the middle, no publisher. I hired an editor and, you know, I worked with different creative collaborators on it, but like there was no one above me that could pull the rug. When you work on like big Hollywood movies, you're constantly thinking like, is this next draft that I turn in going to be the last one before I get fired? Or is the movie going to get canned, you know, for reasons that have nothing to do with, to do with me. Um, like I lit, like I worked on a movie that literally got like, got shit canned like six weeks before production and it was all set to go. And they, and they pulled the plug and I was so upset. I almost quit the business over because I said, why even bother? Like you put all this work into it and like, it gets killed for reasons that aren't even creative reasons. They're like, you know, they're, they're economic reasons or things that have nothing to do with you. Hello, David Peterson. Interesting time for you to show up. Um, and so I, I think that actually might've been the, 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 the snapping point for me is I can't do this again. I can't continue to work on things that I really, really, well, it was an interesting time for you to make yourself known, David. I'm sure that wasn't coincidental. Um, I'm tired of working on things where um, I'm constantly like waiting for the other shooter drop. Am I going to get fired? Am I going to get rewritten? Is this movie going to get, you know, tossed out for reasons that are nothing to do with you? And I just wanted to have something where I controlled my own creative destiny. And so I thought, I'm not even going to go through a traditional publisher. I'll just self-publish the book. 
and I get to decide when it comes out. I get to decide all the key creative decisions on it. And for better or worse, when you see this thing and experience this thing, as you will very soon, not just the the trailer tonight, but like the the actual kind of weekly show that's going to be starting soon for the for the for uh, nine weeks, as I believe how many episodes we have nine nine episodes nine weekly episodes. Um, I just it, it's it's all on me. Like if you like it, that's on me. If you don't like it, that's on me. Um, and I just wanted to do something that that was like from me to you and no one else in between and just re- and again communicate directly with an audience and do it in a way where we are actually communicating so what i did was i took the book and i chopped it up into nine pieces and through doing animal talking and through my day job in hollywood i am fortunate enough to know people in show business people who act people who write music people who make things and collaborate on cool stuff. And so I called a few people up and I said, would you be interested in helping me make this? And amazingly, they all said yes. And so what we did was we took the book and we adapted it into an audio format, essentially an audio book um, that that is now in the form of nine kind of weekly episodes. And we're going to do a bunch of different things with it. Um, it's going to be available on podcast services. That, that's going to happen very soon. I'll have a podcast feed for, for you to subscribe to very soon in the next week or two. And so if you want to listen to it, you know, on your own time when you're driving the car or doing the laundry or whatever, you'll be able to listen to it just like you would any other narrative podcast. Um, it's all, it'll also be on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Gary Witter. The, all the episodes will be archived there and you'll be able to watch it whenever you want to watch it. But kind of the flag, I don't, I, don't, I don't know if it's necessarily the version of, of this that most people, if most people will watch it this way, but it will certainly, I think, be the most interesting way to watch it. Is each episode going to debut, before it's on a podcast, before it's on YouTube, each episode will be here, on this channel, on Twitch. And each, I'm, every episode, I'll show up, much as I am here now, uh, and I'll introduce the episode, kind of like Masterpiece Theatre style. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about the episode, no spoilers or anything. And then we'll switch over to another scene. And it's an audio, It's essentially a radio show. It's all audio. And there's stuff on the screen for you to look at, but it really is just because, you know, there has to be something to look at. But it's 100% an audio project. It's an audio drama. And so I'd like a radio show, like a radio drama. But if you've ever read an if you've ever read an audio book or listened to an audio book, you'll you'll be familiar with what this is. We've done a couple of things with it that are a little bit more ambitious than than a traditional audio book, I think. Uh, but it is for the most part a format that you're familiar with. What is that? Oh, that's my. I should really turn my alerts off. There we go. When people <laughs> when people subscribe to my YouTube channel now, because my YouTube is connected to my Streamlabs. Um, I get an alert here. I have no idea how that works, but I do. But somebody went to my YouTube channel when I just mentioned it on the stream there and they went and subscribed. And please do do that. Go to uh, youtube.com slash Gary Witter because we're going to be doing a lot of stuff there that's not on the Twitch channel. There's going to be the the original soundtrack is going to be there. Um, There's going to be some behind the scenes stuff. There's going to be other bits and pieces as well as just the episodes. Um... But as I was saying, the flagship part of this, and we're working with Twitch on this because Twitch are quite excited about this because they, again, they like the idea of showcasing Twitch as as a platform for things other than just um, watching people play video games. I mean, that's great. That's what I do, right? You mostly, mostly watch me play Fall Guys. But Animal Talking was something different, right? And people liked that. And so this is something different as well, obviously, uh, in a very different way, though. And so what I imagine is, and what I hope will happen is, as we play each episode, each episode's about an hour long. So the whole thing, I think, is a little under nine hours. There's nine episodes. So like when, so like when episode one comes along, which will probably be in a in a in a few weeks. There's a couple of other things we're going to do bef- to get ready before we launch it, but it's very it's very very close now. It's it's almost done. It's almost completely done. Um, when episode one is playing and you're hearing the narration and hearing the story, you'll all be hearing it and listening to it and experiencing it together, because you're all here in the chat. And so what I want to try and create or recreate 
is like an old, like almost like a cinema type experience where everyone experiences it together. Or almost like a radio show where you're like, like people kind of around the radio in the olden days, kind of listening to a radio show together. But you'll all be doing it live in the chat. There'll be hundreds of you here. I don't know how many, but there'll be a lot of people here. And if there is like a big plot twist or a surprising thing happens, kill off a major character or an unexpected moment or whatever, you all get to react to it together and, and do kind of like a commentary, like a watch along as you're going. I won't, I'll, I'm going to step back and you guys are going to listen to it and experience it, experiencing it together. But then when the episode is done and the credits roll, I will then come back again and I'll be again, I'll be here again live um, as the author of the, the, and the creator of the thing that you all just listened to. And I'll participate in like whatever, really, like you call it a book club, uh, author Q and a discussion, whatever. I'll answer questions about it. You know, I'll, I'll talk to you about it. I'll participate in a, in a thing with you. I guess, again, again, the analogy would be, I guess if you've ever been to like a book reading, like an author does a reading from a new book and you know, you go and sit in the folding chairs and they read, like they read a passage from their new book. And then when they're done, they answer questions and you can talk to the, to the author. So you'll be able to do that with me every week for nine weeks. And um, I think that's potentially really fun and really interesting. And there's actually going to be the other, the other thing is I want to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to kind of listen to the live version of it. So again, there'll be a podcast that you can listen to at your leisure. There'll be a YouTube version that you can listen to at your leisure. And that, but that'll just be the audio. It won't have like the live bookends with me and that you won't have the kind of the communal aspect of everyone listening to the, 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 the audio together. Um, but I want to make sure that enough people have the opportunity to do that. Uh, and so here's what we're going to do. Again, I don't have the dates exactly lined up yet, but it'll be something like this. Uh, let's say that episode one and each weekly episode goes out on a, th a Thursday night, much like tonight, 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Eastern. And it runs for like an hour and a half, two hours, because it's an hour of audio. But then you've also got like my intro and my, and, you know, the back end at the end when I answer questions and what have you. Um, but if you're in the UK or Europe or somewhere else in the world, like that's like four o'clock in the morning, right? You can't, you're probably not going to stay up for that. So after the Thursday night broadcast, like well, that will be the premiere broadcast, I will come back, let's say on Saturday morning or Sunday morning, like 11 a.m. my time, which would be like the evening in the UK and Europe. And we'll just do it all again. We'll just do another performance. I'll come back live. I'll introduce it again. We'll run the audio again. You can all listen to it. And then I'll do another Q&A. And that'll be basically like a matinee performance for people in different time zones. Because I really want to give everyone the opportunity to kind of listen to it live without having to stay up, you know, until four o'clock in the morning. Plus, I think it will be fun. And I get, you know, this way we all get to do it. I don't know if anyone's going to want to come back and listen to it all over again. But the, the, the point is that wherever you are in the world, there'll be, a, there'll be a, a performance of it that will hopefully not be too inconvenient for you to come and, and, and participate in live. So that's the idea. Um... And so I've been talking for a while. I think maybe we should just kind of like, um, we should just kind of like get into it. And yeah, I, I, I see the messages in the chat. Obviously, I, I don't know when Critical Role goes live. I don't, I, I, or when like the, the best nights to do that. I, I'm going to look into, I'm going to, I'm going to look into that. Like if Critical Role goes out on Thursday night at seven o'clock, I probably won't do that because, you know, those are the big boys and I'm a little, little minnow um, over here. Um, but we'll see, look, look, this is an experiment. And I have no idea if this is going to work. And I fully expect to not make any money out of this. This is all going to be given away for free. Uh, obviously, the Twitch channel, you don't have to subscribe or anything to come listen to it. This will be open. Obviously, the YouTube channel is free. And the podcast will be free. You won't have to subscribe to it. And there won't be any advertising on it either. Because I don't want to make money on it. I make money at my day job. This is kind of like a weird little side project, science fair school projects let's see what let's see what happens if we try and do something weird and different um and i think it is kind of interesting because essentially we are publishing a book uh you know this is this is adapted from a you know a, a literary work that i wrote um and it's an audio book but again instead of being on audible it'll be here and it'll be serialized in nine weekly chunks that everyone gets to gets to listen to together. And so I think, you know, it's kind of like, it's, you know, it's kind of disruptive, I guess, like in a cool way, like no one's ever used Twitch quite this way before. No one's ever published a book 
quite this way before, but that's what we're going to be doing. I'm going to be publishing a book over the course of nine weekly episodes. And then at the end of all of that, when the, when the, when the nine weeks is up and the story is concluded, um, I will actually publish the book. Like the, the, the book that this is adapted from is still sitting around. Like this doesn't replace the book. It's just additive to it. But the audio version is coming. Weirdly, the adaptation is actually coming first. And you're going to listen to it first. But not, every, not everyone loves listening to audio books, right? It's, it, it's interesting. Audio books, you may not know this, are like a third of the market of publishing. Like a third of the people that buy and read books are actually people that are listening to audio books. It's a massive segment of the market. So you kind of have to, if you want people to take your book seriously, like publishers, you have to do an audio book. Um, an Abomination, you know, had an audio book. I didn't have anything to do with it because, again, I didn't control it. Um, but uh, the book will be published, and that is something that you will pay for. I'm probably going to publish it just through, like, Amazon and iBooks, and there'll be an ebook uh, that you'll be able to read on your Kindle or whatever device you have, and we'll, I'll, I'll put, like, a reasonable price on it, like five bucks or whatever, and then there'll be a paperback version. Maybe that's 10 bucks. I don't know, but that'll come out at the end. I actually am going to, before we're done here tonight, I'm actually going to show you the cover of the book and I'm going to show you a bunch of stuff and you're going to see things in here. I've got concept art. I've got the trailer. I've got original music. There's all kinds of stuff that we're going to get into. I've been, we've been doing this for like 45 minutes and I haven't even shown you anything yet. So I'm very uh, grateful to the 637 people that have been patient enough with me to like get to this. But um very few, very few people know what this is. The people that have been working on it with me, which is like, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 people know what this is. Um, and I've always had to like, whenever I've talked, because I've talked about this in vague ways on the, on, on the stream before, and I've always had to say like, oh, the thing, the project, the new thing. I can never say the name of it because I want to like, you know, that, that's been a secret for a long time. But that's going to end right now because we're going to run the trailer. You're going to hear original music. Uh, which was written by a very auspicious composer who I'm sure you've heard of. You are going to hear the amazing voice of a very, very talented actor who I'm also sure you've heard of. Um, and you're going to see the name of this thing. You're going to see what this thing is and get a sense of it. And then after that's done, um, I'll show you some, I'll, I'll give you a little synopsis a little bit because the, because the trailer is really just a teaser. And again, given that it's an audio, just bear in mind, like set your expectations a little bit here. Given that this is an audio thing, you're not going to see like, you know, ILM visual effects or anything. And this, in, in, this in fact is a trailer that I mostly made myself. This was me dicking around like in iMovie with a little bit of help from a friend of mine uh, called Chandana Ekanayaka, who did, who helped me with the, with the uh, video editing and made it look less shitty, but it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a pretty, basic trailer that's really just the visuals are just that they're just meant to be there to kind of support the sound um but then when we come back on the other side i'll be able to talk to it in more detail so again i've been talking about this thing in like super vague terms for a really long time i think it is time to show you this trailer and i've tested this like a dozen different ways this morning it should work the audio should work if you don't hear anything because the sound comes up immediately. If you don't hear anything right away, let me know. Otherwise, just enjoy. Here we go. Much of our history is lost. But here's what I know. They came to us in peace, offering a new future for our people. Our planet, asking little in return. Then came the war. Some believe that one day, our time will come to take back our planet. My name is Dakota Bregman. That's it. That's all I know.
So it's called Gun Dog, and it's a it's an incredible relief to be able to finally say that name on stream because for some reason I was like really protective about keeping it a, a secret. Um, and it's performed by Shannon Woodward, who I'm sure you know from uh, HBO's Westworld and uh, The Last of Us Part Two. She's amazing in it. She re she did the whole thing, and it's. You'll notice it says like performed by, not narrated by or read by, because she really does perform it. She went above and beyond what you would expect, like the like the narrator of an audio book to do. She really went all out, and it's an incredible performance. And I can't wait for you to hear it. Um, and the music that you just heard, the original music, is by Austin Wintery, who uh, you may know as the incredibly talented Grammy nominated BAFTA winning. Uh, composer of games like Journey. He's worked on Assassin's Creed. He's working on a big Netflix show right now. Uh, just an incredibly talented uh, composer. And he wrote an entire orchestral soundtrack for this. Just a tiny little piece of it um, you just heard. Um, but there's much more. Every episode has its own unique overture that Austin wrote at the beginning. So you're going to want to come early because there's a different uh, piece of orchestral music for every for each episode. And like I said, each episode lasts about an hour. I think the whole thing's about eight hours and 40 something minutes. Some episodes are longer than others, uh, but they're all roughly about an hour long. And when this thing starts, it'll run every week at the same time and, and uh, the same same night and same time or well, I should say nights and times, because we'll do two a week um, for nine weeks. And when it when it wraps up at the end of the nine weeks, we'll talk about the actual physical book that's going to come out. Um, will the music be available somewhere later? Yes. So all of the soundtrack I'm going to be putting on my YouTube. And uh, I'll, run the, I'll run the trailer again before this is all over for people that missed it. And, it'll, and the trailer's going up on my YouTube channel. It'll be, it'll be everywhere. I'll, I'll tweet it out. You'll see it now. I'll show it again before the stream's over, but I've got some other stuff to show you first. Um, where was I? Oh, yeah. So, the, and the soundtrack, I know Austin, I spoke to Austin yesterday. He's going to put it on Spotify and probably on Apple Music and a bunch of different places. So you'll be able to get the soundtrack. The soundtrack's fantastic. I listen to it in the car all the time. It's so good. It's so good. He really, he really went all out. Um, so beautiful music, incredible for, uh, performance by Shannon. Uh, she really kind of, she really like got her teeth into it and just did an incredible, incredible job. Um, and I don't know how much you're really able to discern from that trailer because it really is a very, very vague teaser trailer. It doesn't really tell you anything other than um, there was some kind of war, science fiction, gun dog. What's a gun dog? I don't know. What is that? What is gun dog? I don't know. Well, I have a little synopsis that I'm going to share with you that will tell you a little bit. I had a longer synopsis, but I thought it gave too much away. So I went, I, I went and did a shorter one. So um, this, is the, this is the synopsis. In the near future, Earth has been conquered by a race of alien machines known as the Mech. And an entire generation has grown up under their brutal rule. When a rebellious young woman imprisoned in a Mech labor camp stumbles across a mysterious map that may hold the secret to liberation... She embarks on a dangerous journey that leads her to an amazing discovery, a long-lost prototype war machine that will spark the beginning of humanity's fight back against their alien oppressors. I can confirm to you that the long-lost prototype war machine is uh, a 60-foot-tall, 600-ton mech that is the most badass fucking thing you've ever seen in your life. It is so fucking cool. And I'm very excited for you to see it. Um, and see it you will even though it's an audio uh, project. In fact, I can show it to you right now because we have some concept art. You want to see some concept art? Here's Dakota with the gun dog. And uh, this, is, this is an original design that was done for us by a concept artist by the name of Owen Freeman, who's incredibly talented. And I kind of told him like what elements of mech design I was excited by and showed him some stuff from the book that described what the mech looks like. 
and how it's armed and how it moves around. And he, he came up, like, this was the first version that he did. And I was like, oh my God, that's exactly what it looks like. That is exactly what I had in my head was this, was, was like basically this. It's, I don't, I don't know really how big like other mechs are, but it's, this is, it's big and it look maybe it looks smaller than it really is there because Dakota is, is standing like way, way, way in front of it and there's some perspective um, in play. But yeah, in the book, it's described as uh, about 60 feet tall and weighing about 600 tons. So I don't, I don't know how that compares to like other things in the mech canon, but it's a, it's a big bastard. And it's got some very, very cool tricks and toys. Like I said, it's an experimental prototype. And so it does some really, really fucking cool shit. Um, this is the mech prison camp that was described in the, uh, in the synopsis. In the future, humanity has basically been, all the, all the, all the humans that survived the invasion of Earth by these, uh, by these aliens. Who are, it's, it's essentially a machine race. They're not an organic race. They're all, they're all basically kind of robots and machines of different kinds. And the remaining survivors for the last 20 years have been kind of rounded up and put in concentration camps. And that's kind of where the story begins with uh, Dakota, who's this young woman who, um, whose mother fought in the war and died when she was very young and she's grown up. Well, the only, kind of the only really life she's ever known is living in these camps. And she has an opportunity to escape and, uh, and go find them, go for, again, for reasons that will become more apparent when the story's being told. Uh, unites her with, the, with that big ass mech. And um, lots of ass kicking ensues, and I think it's uh, I think it's very very cool. Um, so that is for, that is for the most part it. I want to I, I have one I have a couple of other things to show you, um, but first of all I want to I, I I'm sure I'll be doing this as lot as 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 time goes on, but I want to make sure that people. Um, no, even though I say, oh, this is all me and I wanted to do something all by myself. Obviously, Shannon, I couldn't have done it. with. I, there's no way I was going to read this myself. Um, she does an amazing job. I mean, she doesn't just read the story. Like she basically like really does kind of play the, the character of Dakota Bregman, the, the protagonist of the story. Um, oh, and one other thing I forgot to mention. There is a special mystery guest actor in this who we're not going to reveal ahead of time and we're not going to name until they actually show up. I believe episode three, they show up for the first time and then they're in the rest of it. Um, but uh, I'll be interested to see if you can guess who it is because it is one of the most recognizable names in this field. And when you find out who it is, you will shit because I can't believe he agreed to do it, but we got him and he's in this and it's very, very, very cool. We're actually going to have a contest because he plays one of the mech. He plays one of the alien robots and we put his voice through so much artificial processing to make him sound like a robot. It's very, very hard to figure out who he had, to figure out like who's actually underneath all of that. Um, but he did an incredible job and I'm going to, when, when the time comes, we're going to run the episode. And one of the things you guys can have fun with in chat maybe is like, when you, when you hear it, you'll know, oh shit, this is the, this is that thing that Gary was talking about. Um, and I invite you all to guess and we're actually going to have a little contest. So we're doing a thing with Ray. I forgot, I forgot to mention this. We're doing a thing with Razor. Um, uh, Razor provided us with a bunch of, um, equipment to help us make this project laptops and other bits and pieces and uh they actually shot a whole behind the scenes video about how this was made in the studio with shannon when austin was composing they came here to my office and they shot like a whole behind the scenes documentary and that will be coming out at some point in the near future as well um but i believe the last time i, I spoke to razor they liked the idea of like kind of the mystery guest thing and they said why don't we do a contest for who can guess who the who the mystery voice is, and we'll give away a prize to whoever uh, can is, is the first to guess it or whatever. And so I think I think we're going to give away some like cool Razor headphones or something on in episode three on the back end. 
for people who uh, for for someone who like everyone who selects correctly guesses it. We'll pick someone at random, or we'll play marbles or something. Who the fuck knows? But we'll find someone and you'll you'll get a there's there's some there's some cool razor goodies. But I think you will be very pleased. And very amused when you when you find out who it is. That's actually one of my favorite things about what we're doing with this project. Um, and so, oh, okay. So to that to that point, I, I and again, I'll be doing this a lot. You'll probably get sick of hearing me do it, uh, as I'm sure they are already sick of hearing me saying it to them. But like, I couldn't have done this without Shannon. It's she's incredible in it, and she devoted so much of her time recording this not just the eight hours in the booth but it's actually a lot more than that but then she had to come back and do all the adr or the pickups you know anything that was like where we didn't get clean audio or and you have to remember we actually did all of this during the pandemic so like that trailer that you just heard with shannon's audio she recorded that at home under her under her comforter into her iphone because we couldn't get her into a studio because of the pandemic everything was shut and so we kind of like found a way to kind of make it work. And some of it she recorded at home in her home studio. Some of it we did at Austin's facility, his home studio. And some we did at a professional recording studio in Burbank. Um, and we kind of chopped it all together. And given that we had to do it under very, you know, kind of pandemic-y conditions, I think it actually sounds pretty good. We did a lot of audio cleanup work on it uh, to make it sound like as good as some of it is you would hear on Audible or whatever. You know, Audible will charge you like 20 bucks for a book. Again, you're going to get this for fucking free uh, just because I'm such a nice person. Um, but yeah, Shannon and Austin will get a lot of credit and praise from me for this. But like everyone knows they're a part of it, right? Because they're up front, like their names are on the trailer with mine. They are the kind of the public faces of it because they're kind of, you know, what they call above the line. Um, but there was also a bunch of other people uh, that helped make it that you'll be hearing more about. Guess what? Adam Nickerson was a big part of this. Adam actually did almost all of the audio editing and sound mastering on it and basically taught himself how to do that, how to, how to master sound uh, and how to do audio editing and actually did an incredible job on it. So Adam, you'll be hearing more from and more about as we go on. He really like, again, he did a bunch of stuff that I never could have done. Like we had some audio that sounded really bad because it was just recorded in bad conditions and he and and he cleaned it up and made it sound like it was perfect. Like it was amazing what he was able to do. Um, so I'll do more behind scenes stuff as as we go. There's an interesting story about like how this was all made. Um, but Adam did a ton. Chandana, who did helped with the trailer editing and designed that logo that you saw. Oh, I should put the logo up on the screen. I forgot that I have that. There you go. So like when I'm here, when I'm here over the nine weeks, we'll have like very impressive graphics like this that took me all of two minutes to put together. Um, that's Chandana's logo that he did. Very, very cool. Um, who else? Streamlabs created custom stream graphics for us that you'll be seeing when we start, when we start running the show, custom graphics and animations. Um, I'm trying to think who else I'm going to blank on some names, but there's, there's, I, we'll get to it. There's a lot of people to, to make sure that they, they are properly, um, credited for this and um so i'm going to wrap i'm going to show you a couple more things before we go but i don't want to keep you for too much longer you guys have been i appreciate you been sticking around for the whole hour uh, i hope it's been interesting enough and i hope you'll i hope you will come back for the actual broadcasts the actual shows because i think it's really really fun and interesting and something different a different kind of way to spend time on twitch put headphones on and just you know kind of be told a cool story and and listen to it and comment along with everyone else it's something something you know you don't typically see on on twitch um and like i said there'll be two different broadcasts of it and then going forward here's what i think we're going to do i think either in a week or two weeks from now i'm going to come back here and we're going to kind of show oh shit billy sunrider i forgot i'm so glad you mentioned that i forgot in terms of like the different pieces of this, um, and I have no idea if this is a terrible idea or not, but as there's the podcast, right? There's the audio thing. There's the physical book, the ebook that will come out at the end. Um, I did actually have commissioned and made from the same people that do all of Critical Role's merch, all of their, uh, their, their kind of miniatures, their pieces. Um, 
an actual gun dog. And I had a bunch of them. I have a bunch of them being made right now. And I'm going to have a limited edition of them that if, if should you be interested enough, I will sign, sign one for you and sell it to you. I think we're having 500 made. Um, and that is something that, uh, I'll figure out a way, I'll figure out a way to do that. But basically if you want one of these on your desk, I, I, I'm the man to see, I can get that to you. So, um, next week or the week after, there'll be one more stepping stone between where we are. This is like, kind of like the first thing. There's one more thing we're going to do and then we'll do episode one. So the thing we're going to do between now and episode one is uh, probably next week or the week after we'll come back. There is there is a prologue in the book. Before chapter one, there's like a little prologue, which is just kind of Dakota's, like Shannon's like doing the prologue. And it's like six, like five, six minutes of audio. And we're just going to, we'll do just the prologue. So that'll give you like a better, better sense in the trailer it will give you like a real sense of what this thing is. And that's just an opportunity because we'll come back and we'll have the different setup, the different stream graphics and all that kind of stuff. And that'll be like a little five minute preview of what is to come. And that's an opportunity for me to just kind of test the stream, make sure the audio levels are good and everything's working the way it should, but also an opportunity for you to kind of have a little preview of the actual um, thing. Um, and then after that, we'll actually do episode one. Like the, I think episode... Let me look. How long is episode one? Uh, do I have it in here? It's like 59 minutes. Or so. It's almost exactly an hour. Um, yeah. Um, and then we'll do episode one. And then we'll do and then we'll do that every week for the next nine weeks. Uh, somebody said, um, will there be a VOD somewhere or should we sub to your Twitch channel? Well, you can do, you don't have to sub to the channel. You should follow it. You should at least follow the channel. You don't have to subscribe to it. I mean, if you want to be my guest, but I never like ask for subscribe for subscribers or anything like that. Um, but you should follow the channel, and I do recommend you subscribe to the YouTube channel, which is um, youtubecom slash Witter. because they're all of the vods. If you want to come back and watch the Twitch archive, they'll be archived, but not like indefinitely. I think they only archive them for like fourteen days or something. But the audio, but, but the episodes will be permanently archived on. Um, uh, uh, on YouTube. And again, there'll be, you know, whether, whether it's Spotify, whether it's Apple Music, whether whatever podcast service you use to get your podcast, we'll ha I'll, I'll have a podcast link for you as well. Uh, and that is a good point. Yeah. So if you don't want to, if you don't want to listen to ads or have the you know, worry about an ad uh, skipping, you know, out kind of cutting in in the middle of a, the audio or whatever, then yeah, absolutely subscribe to the channel. But like, don't do it for me because you want to give me money because I really, I, I don't need the money. Uh, but if you want to have a better experience, then yes, you, you won't have to worry about an ad showing up at, at an inopportune uh, moment. Um, what I might do is I, I have the manual ability to run a 60 second ad. And I believe that when you do that, it prevents another ad from being played for a certain amount of time. So what I might do is before we run each episode, I might make you sit through a 60 second ad just to kind of get the ad out of the way because I'd rather you hear it before the episode starts than it cut in randomly because the Twitch algorithms decided to spam you with it like in the middle of the episode. So um, I don't know. I'm looking into that, but we'll figure something out. Do people get ads watching VODs? I don't know. I don't know. But yeah, use your Twitch. If you want to use your Twitch Prime sub, that's, that's valid as well. Um, there's any number of ways to get around the ads. Uh, and again, it will be on YouTube and it will be on, on podcast services and the podcast will not have any ads. So I'm not going to click the button to put ads on it. So, um, so that I, so I think that's all going to be very good. How do all involved get paid? I mean, everyone just kind of did this cause they, cause they dug the projects to be honest with you. I didn't spend a lot of money on this because I didn't expect to make any money. So this was just kind of like a fuck it. Let's just all get together and do something cause it's cool type project. So it was the whole thing was kind of done on a shoestring, um, very kind of very kind of duct taped together. You'd you'd never know that to hear it. I mean, it, re it really really sounds really professional and very good. And, and no thanks to me because all I did was write the words. But between Shannon's performance and Austin's music and Adam and another company that we used um, uh, to master the audio, it sounds really really good. 
and Adam will tell you I've been driving him nuts with like how how anal I am with like can can we make this syllable sound a little bit better and like I just I get I'm very very much a perfectionist about this kind of stuff and I hear every little imperfection hopefully when you hear it you won't notice anything but I know where all the little kind of gremlins and, and mistakes are and things like that um and then when that's all over we will actually publish the book like a physical book like a, a um is an ebook but also like a physical paperback that you'll be able to get most likely from Amazon we'll probably do it through our iBooks as well how much research did you do for gun dogs weapons? I mean, very little because they're all made up. They're all like made up science fiction weapons. Um, I did have fun making up the weapons and inventing cool, cool weapons for the gun dog to have. Uh, but there wasn't a ton of research involved. Um, thank you very much, Adam, for the announcement. I appreciate that. Um, hey, Austin. And here is Austin Wintry in the chat. Um, what an unfortunate way for you to find out, Austin, that you're not being paid. I'm sorry. I was going to have that conversation with you tomorrow. But perhaps it's perhaps it's best that we do. You know how they say like when you want to break up with someone, do it like in a restaurant so they won't make a scene. Let's. This is where I'm telling you that you're not getting paid in front of all these hundreds of people. In this way, uh, it won't. You know, there won't. There won't have to be any drama because if there is, I could just ban you. I can just press a button and you're gone. I already have. The, I already have all the music here. So you know what are you going to do? Um, but yes, this is all very exciting. And then I'm going to show you something else. Uh, I'm going to run the trailer one more time because it's only like a minute long. And some people, I think, came in late and didn't see it. And again, it will go on YouTube uh, right after this. I'll put it on YouTube almost immediately after this. Um, I'm going to show you the cover of the book. I decided to kind of do this at the last minute, but fuck it, why not? So um, probably sometime in the fall, let's, let's say this starts first week in August, right? And it runs for nine weeks. So August, September, like mid-October, the book will, will will be a thing that you can go get. Again, maybe you're interested in this story, but you don't like listening to audio books. You want to actually sit down and read a book. Well, in mid-October, you'll be able to do it. Uh, here it is. This is the, this is the cover um, of the physical edition of the book, uh, which, is, which will, again, hopefully come out sometime in uh, early October. Uh, and you'll be able to go get, you'll, again, you'll be able to get either a digital version of that or a physical paperback. And I'll find some way for people who are really interested um, to, we'll do, we'll do some signed, uh, copies as well. Um, and that's a, there's a better look at the, the, the mech. I almost said, I almost said the name of it. Like it's it, it beyond being called a gun, like a gun dog is the type of mech, but the mech in the book has a specific name, which I accidentally almost said, but I didn't want to, I don't want to do that because it's a reveal, um, in the story. Um, but that's the physical book that will be out, um, in October once the audio series is done. Um, so who knows what to expect? Who knows if anyone's going to show up? Uh, you know, a bunch of you showed up for this announcement because I hyped it up and made it sound like it was going to be an exciting thing. Maybe you're not that excited about this. Maybe no one's going to show up for episode one. Maybe you, like, maybe you listen to episode one and you hate it. Maybe, the, maybe by the time I get to episode one, it's just me and Adam sitting here listening to it. I don't know. But, we're, but the point is we're going to try something different. Uh, we're going to try to do something in a different way. We're going to try to bring you a story in a way that isn't just publishing a book or putting a movie in a movie theater uh, or a comic. I mean, all of those things are valid and brilliant. I'm not in, in, in any way denigrating those things. I just wanted to try, try and do something in a different way for once. I'm glad you're, da I'm glad you're excited, David Peterson. I have a lot of, lot, of, lot of respect for your creative instincts. And if you like it, then that makes me feel, feel good about um, uh, giving this a try. But like I said, like the idea of like a live, not live, it's not performed live, but I'll be here live, a quite a, a kind of semi live uh, audio book, radio drama, sci fi thing uh, that will that will use the medium of Twitch to kind of play out. And you can all listen to it together and comment in the chat together and compare notes and talk about if you loved or hated it. And again, I'll answer questions. I'll talk about what might be coming up on subsequent episodes. If you're, you know, something you're not sure on you've got a theory or whatever I'll, I'll do my best to kind of engage with you on that I'll, I'll, I'll be around to kind of talk about it because it's exciting for me to talk. I've worked on this for a long time like I said this goes all the way back to 2004 and I started writing the book in 2018 and it's only now in mid 2022 that I'm actually like on the verge of kind of getting it in front of an audience so I'm excited about it I'm excited to go on this journey with you really excited and there's a lot of fun stuff coming along the way like I said we're going to have some merch uh, get Pat Rothfuss to come to the post show with you. If only I like Pat, he's a good friend of mine. He's a good guy. Um, 
I, I, I listen. I'd be thrilled if he just like came in and and and, and listened for two minutes and just showed up in the chat. I hope some of my some of my writer friends will 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 tune in. I'm trying, like I said, trying to do something different. It's not. This is like I said. This is no, nothing quite like this has ever been done before, and that's a good enough reason for me to give it a try. And maybe it doesn't work, but I don't have like. It's not like oh, if this doesn't sell or if this doesn't succeed, like I'm not going to be able to pay the bills. Like, I'm paying the bills doing other things. So this is really just purely about let's try and do something and see if people are interested. That's really my only metric of success. Like, will people be interested in this? Will they show up? Do they think it? Will they think it's any good? Um, beyond that, I have no like commercial metric for for this being successful at all. Like I said, there's, there's almost no way in which this be, in which this is being monetized, other than selling the physical book on Amazon. And that's only because Amazon l won't l let you give anything away. Like you've got to charge something. Ooh, fan art's a good idea. That's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's funny. I was talking about Masterpiece Theater. I was talking about, I was thinking about getting one of those big high backed leather armchairs and doing kind of like the Masterpiece Theater thing with the smoking jacket. I don't think we're going to do that. I don't think we're going to, I don't think we're going to go all out PBS, but we're going to have some fun with it. Um, I'm going to run the trailer one more time and then I'll come back and say goodnight. We've been here for over an hour. You've been very patient with me. I wanted to kind of like, there was a lot of stuff I wanted to get off my chest about like why, what this is and how we got here and what the whole point of this is. And you've been very patient to listen to me. Um, and so for those that came late or for those who may want to hear it again, um, we'll run the trailer one more time. Again, this is all original music. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Austin wrote so much beautiful music for this, for this, uh, for this piece. And, and Shannon really knocked it out of the park. Some of you guessed it. Some of you identified Shannon's voice right away because she is very recognizable and she's so damn good. Anyway, let's play the trailer one last time. Then I'll come back and say goodbye and uh, we'll raid someone because I've historically never, ever, ever once ended a stream without a raid. Um, so we'll make sure that we do that. Uh, one more time. Here's the trailer. Much of our history is lost. But here's what I know. They came to us in peace, offering a new future for our people, our planet, asking little in return. Then came the war. Some believe that one day, our time will come to take back our planet. My name is Dakota Bregman. That's it. That's all I know. How good is that music? Seriously, Austin's just amazing. Some of you, when we when we were in the waiting room, were like, oh, this has kind of a Last of Us type vibe to it. And that, in fact, Austin will remember, that's literally what I said to him, was like, I kind of want this to have a Last of Us type vibe to it. Like I didn't, even though it's a very high tech story, I didn't want it to have a, a high tech set. I wanted it to feel, because a lot of the a lot of the story is kind of set in the, like the American Midwest. Um, like uh, places like, I don't, know if, I don't know if you could really consider this Midwest, but like a lot of it takes place in like Wyoming, and uh, North and South Dakota, places like that. And it's, I wanted it to have kind of a very rustic kind of vibe, similar to, similar to kind of the, um, you know, the, 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 the guitar strings of, um, of The Last of Us. And Austin kind of captured that really, really well. Um, and you'll be hearing a lot, more, a lot more of his music. You heard it in the waiting room. Uh, and there'll be more of that, like, like, the, like the 10 minute countdown that we always have to streams, like you're going to want to come to those because there's original, there's original music over every one of those. 
Like, it's not just like placeholder, you know, like copyright free bullshit music. It's actually the soundtrack of the piece um, that will be playing. It'll be, and it's, and I believe Austin wants to do like a different piece each time. Um, so it's really, really cool. I'm very, I haven't had a chance to like um, fully, uh, uh, absorb all of the comments from the chat because I was just like talking a lot but I'm going to go back and watch the VOD and just like make sure I heard if, if anyone's got like questions or comments I'm going to try to like make sure I see as many of them as possible after the fact I did what I could while I was um while I was here with you uh but um I want to go back and make sure that I didn't miss anything cool 8-bit D thank you very much I hope you'll be showing up for each of the nine weeks that we do this um Linda Wells, 0307. Congrats, Gary. This is exciting. And that's my mother-in-law, so she has to like it. Um, but nevertheless, I very much appreciate her giving me uh, the thumbs up, and uh, I think she'll really enjoy it as well. <laughs> um, Gymnasium, thank you very much for uh, Twitch Prime. Thank you, very, thank you very much for two months. Welcome to the LOG. Can't finish a stream without having at least one welcome to the LOG. And that's it. So stay. So uh, the other thing is, if you don't already follow me on Twitter, make sure you do that at Gary Witter on Twitter, G A R Y W H I T T A, just like the name in the Twitch channel. That is probably where I'm going to be doing most of the announcements for this. Um, if you want to know what the schedule is going to be, if you want to know like when when the episodes are going out, if you want to know when we're going to be doing that prologue broadcast, which will be between this and the full on episode one launch, follow me on Twitter and make sure that you know, you're you're seeing those tweets because that's where the information uh, is going to be coming out. But like maybe as early as next week. Um, and uh, Gundog, in fact, is not too long for Ludal. We have six letter words in Ludal now. It's just not a lewd word. I mean, I guess you could make it one. Um, but um, yeah, maybe as early as next week, we'll be back here and we'll do like, we'll really get into it because we have like this whole six minute prologue that I want to play for you guys. Uh, and then we'll, And then after that, we'll get really, really into it with um the the first hour long show so that is pretty much it and again thank you so much let's raid someone i'm not going to play any video games tonight because that whole thing finally being able to talk about this with you guys and, and show the trailer and see that you're excited about it was uh, very much um uh exciting for me i'm gonna send you over you know who i've not raided i don't think ever is my good friend Stella Chung from IGN. She is playing Apex Legends right now, uh, a, comp a game that was made by the company that made Titanfall. So that's as good a link as I can give you to Gundog. Um, but uh, I think a good enough reason to say, hey, Stella's cool and she's very good at Apex Legends and we should raid her and we should go over and say hello. And she's only got what she got watching her right now. 24 people, come on we got like 400 people in here. We can, we can do that. We can do that. Uh, let's do that. Let in, let's in fact do that. Let's hit Parallax. Her name is Parallax Stella on Twitch. And we are going to fire up the raid siren right now. I'll be in the channel on the other side. Go say hello. Thank you. Stay tuned for updates. There's going to be hours and hours and hours of this gun dog shit coming at you in the near future. Thank you so much. I'll see you on the other side. He swung back through to like two yeah. different times. I'm gonna, I'm gonna.